Um, so I just press share screen, I'm guessing. Yes. Okay. All right, let me just full screen this. Okay, so then I think we press presentation view. Okay, so you guys can see it and okay and everything. Yeah, we can see. Great. Um, so thank you everyone for joining me today. My name is Angeline. I am currently a third year psychiatry resident at the University of Maryland in uh, Baltimore. Um, you can also find me on uh, Instagram at the.psych.md. And if you have any questions about anything, feel free to message me there and I can always like answer them, especially like after the session today as well. Um, so before we get started, I just wanted to give you a little background about me and uh, my path to psychiatry. So um, I'm originally from the Northern Virginia area, um, born and raised there, um, and I still have a lot of uh, family roots there as well. Um, in high school, I learned about this program called um, like a BSMD program. So it's a like combined degree program where you actually apply during the same time you would apply for college. And you actually would interview for college and for med school at the same time. And the nice thing about that was that um, I actually, when I got in, I actually didn't have to take the MCAT, which is like a huge plus because I can imagine that can take a lot of um, time to prepare and study for. And then also it allowed me to have more time to kind of just explore my other interests and stuff like that in um, college as well. So my program was between um, St. Bonaventure University that's in um, like Western New York. So it's uh, at that border between New York and uh, Pennsylvania, a little bit more out West. And it was combined with uh, GW in uh, Washington DC as well. Um, and then after that, I decided to stay local. So I came here to Maryland for a residency. So what exactly is psychiatry? A lot of us, um, including myself, like when I was in like high school and college, my um, visualization of psychiatry was kind of just like, you know, you're like sitting there, um, you know, with the patient like on the couch, not even looking at you. And they're just kind of talking about their problems and you're writing notes in the background. But psychiatry is actually very different from that. And um, that is a form of therapy. So it's called um, like psychoanalysis, but that is just like a very small subset of um, psychiatry. And there's definitely a lot more to it. So according to the um, American Psychiatric Association, this is their definition of um, psychiatry. And it's a specialty of medicine that's focused on um, not only diagnosis and treatment, but also prevention of um, mental, emotional, and behavioral disorders as well. Um, and we deal with a lot of things pertaining to mental health as well as substance use disorders as well. And um, given that we go through medical school, we do have that um, background and training because a lot of times um, there can be medical conditions that can manifest itself as psychiatric symptoms. So a little bit about why I ended up choosing um, psychiatry or why some people are interested in psychiatry. So the big thing is that mental health is all around us. And as you have seen, especially with the pandemic, that has become something that is more prevalent and more talked about in the media about how much um, various things can impact our mental health. And it's very integral part of our overall health and well-being as well. Um, another thing is that's great about psychiatry is you can really develop very strong um, patient relationships and get to really know your patients um, longitudinally and get to know them a lot better than you know any other um, specialty because um, they're often sharing a lot of very um, intimate details about themselves and a lot of their problems that sometimes they've never even uh, shared or talked about with other people. Um, it's a very individualized, like care-based um, practice as well in the sense that you're really trying to work with the patient to come up with, um, you know, you develop rapport with them to come up with like a good treatment plan 
um, that would be best for them. And every case is different. Um, so some people might do better with therapy. Some people might need medication and therapy, or some people just need medication. And then there's also a bunch of various other treatments that you can also use to um, help your patient get better as well. Um, and I really like that you're able to really work with them and form that kind of collaborative um, care with them. Um, I also like how psychiatry has this, um, you know, way of looking at a patient as a whole, and you're not just looking at, you know, the one specific thing that's wrong with them. So sometimes like with like other specialties, like you're only focusing on what the one problem is. Like if they're having a stomach problem, you're kind of mainly focusing on that. Um, or if they're having a cold, you're kind of focusing on that. But with psychiatry, you're looking at not only their mental health, but how it is affected by their biology, their genetic makeup, their family history, and also their social um, issues, such as like maybe they are having issues with the, finding a job or, um, you know, they have um, like financial problems or, um, you know, they're having problems with work or something like that. So it's great to be able to um, look at the patient as a whole um, rather than just focusing on one um, small aspect of the individual. Um, the other thing is that there's still so much to learn and discover in psychiatry. There's definitely a lot of research, a lot of great innovations out there um, that are to be deter to be um, discovered and, and dis uh, learned more about, which is also really cool. So you'll never run out of things to learn and new discoveries. Um, other things is also that it's a really flexible um, career in the sense that if you do one thing when you first get out of residency and you don't feel like you want to do it anymore, it's really easy to switch into something else um, within the realm of psychiatry. So say you first start out doing mostly outpatient um, work or if you're doing like just inpatient working in the hospital, but you want to start building your own practice outpatient, that's possible. Um, you can also do like telehealth. That's a big thing now too. And there's just so many subspecialties within psychiatry that we'll get to in a little bit um, that leads to a lot of um, diversity in the field as well. Um, and it's also a, a pretty good work-life balance, um, which is a which is something that I've come to realize is more important than I thought it would be um, when I was younger. Um, and most of the time you're working, you know, like, you know, nine to five, sometimes you might be working like eight to four, but it's like, it's really up to you. If you want to work more, you can, if you want to work less and, and have more of that work-life balance, that's a possibility as well. So some of the potential downsides with psychiatry is that um, there's a lot of ambiguity in the sense that um, when you're trying to diagnose a patient, you're doing it based on the information you collect on their symptoms and based on, um, you know, sometimes some collateral information from their family. Um, and we diagnose patients based on something called the DSM-5, which is um, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Psychiatry. That um, it's basically a bunch of psychiatrists get together and they discuss what symptoms they think are consistent with um, a certain diagnosis, such as like depression, anxiety, like bipolar, schizophrenia, that sort of thing. But we don't really have any like lab tests or um, you know imaging that you could do that you just order and then the results will tell you exactly what's going on. It's not as simple as that. Um, the other thing is that it takes a lot of patience, meaning that a lot of times um, patients have been struggling with this for a really long time and it's gonna take time for them to get better. Um, it's not like, you know, if you got an infection and you take antibiotics for a week and it gets better. A lot of times you're working with patients for, you know, several months to years before you start seeing change and improvement. And the last thing is that, um, unfortunately, within our society in general, I think mental health still has a lot of stigma. So a lot of times it's the, that's sometimes a barrier for patients to come get care and then also for them to um, be willing to, to get treatment or get help. So the next slide is a little bit about the difference between a psychiatrist and a psychologist, because I personally didn't know when I was in college and high school myself, um, but, but this is kind of 
what I have learned um, after I did some research. Um, so both of them require four years of undergrad. And then for a psychiatrist, you would also need additional four years of med school and then four years of residency. Um, after the four years of residency, you could actually start practicing as um, a general psychiatrist. But if you wanted to do some additional subspecialization, like if you want to work with children and be a child psychiatrist, then you would need additional one to two years of fellowship training as well. And the other thing to note is that um, when you're in residency and fellowship, you're starting to get a salary at that point. Um, versus a psychologist, it would be two to three years to get your master's after undergrad. And then usually um, a lot of um, psychologists also go on to get their doctorate um, or PhD. So that usually takes another three to five years. Um, being a psychiatrist and going through med school also allows you to be able to prescribe medications, order labs and tests as well. Um, and then with a psychologist, I think that they're starting to change the laws in some states where they're able to prescribe medication, but um, it's state by state dependent. Um, Psychiatrists also can do different types of procedures like um, ketamine infusions, um, electroconvulsive therapy, um, TMS, which is transcranial magnetic stimulation, um, stuff like that. Whereas a psychologist um, isn't able to do those, but they are more well versed in different types of psychological testing, um, such as like the testing that you would do to determine whether or not you have ADHD is one example. Um, and the other thing is that uh, both uh, psychiatrists and psychologists can provide therapy, um, but I would say that probably the psychologists would actually have a lot more training in doing um, different types of therapy. Um, at least for me, while I've been in uh, residency, we do get exposure to all the different types of um, psychotherapies, but we just don't go as in depth into it as a psychologist would. Um, and the other thing is that um, given the med school training background, psychiatrists often will treat more complex um, psychiatric conditions like treatment refractory, schizophrenia, or bipolar. Um, some of the more complicated cases would have to be seen by a psychiatrist. So what do psychiatrists typically do? Um, so when someone comes to the hospital for the first time and they're presenting with a lot of psychiatric symptoms, like for example, if they're coming in and they're acting strange, their family saying that um, they've never done this before, but now they're starting to be more irritable or they might be like staying up all night and they're just not acting like themselves. Um, they might be a little bit paranoid and suspicious of others and stuff like that. The first thing that we always do is we do a full medical workup just to rule out any medical causes for those symptoms. So we would do things like we would order blood work. Um, we would check to make sure that they're not having any issues with electrolyte abnormalities. Um, we would also check their vitamin, um, like vitamin levels such as B12, folate, um, we'd also check their thyroid because sometimes when those things are um, abnormal, it can also manifest itself with psychiatric symptoms. Um, we also check like other things like the urine and um, check like a, just to make sure that, that, especially with older people, if they have a urinary tract infection, that can also come sometimes make them look a bit confused or, or something like that. Um, and then we also check uh, like a urine toxicology to see if there are any drugs that they might have ingested that are causing them to behave that way. After we get all of that information and we talk to them, we talk to the family to get kind of a general picture of what's been going on, we'll use that information to diagnose them with um, a condition. And then after that, once we kind of have an, a general idea of what's going on, we can then proceed to treatment, which can be various medications basing, based on what's going on at the time. So I wanted to take a moment just to go through an interesting patient case that I had. Um, so in this case, I had encountered a 50 year old male. He had no prior psychiatric history at all. Um, and he came into the emergency department with his family who said, you know, my, my father's acting weird. Um, when I went to go see him, I noticed that he couldn't sit still. He was talking really fast and I 
had a lot of trouble understanding him. And when he did talk, he would kind of just like talk in circles or just like things that he said didn't make sense. Like they didn't logically line up together. And he had a lot of trouble kind of just sticking to one topic at a time because he was just jumping from one topic to the next. Um, he said that he hadn't slept in five days and he believed that he needed to be up because he was part of a secret society that was called in to protect the president. He ended up uh, getting admitted because this was kind of strange for someone um, at that late in life uh, in their 50s to be presenting with these symptoms. Um, we checked his blood work. We um, did some head imaging. We didn't find anything abnormal in there. Um, so we had to admit him just to observe him a little bit more and try to figure out what's going on. Um, we suspected that it might be a manic episode, um, probably from like bipolar or something, but at that point we weren't quite sure yet. Um, we noticed though, however, two days within his hospitalization, all of a sudden he wasn't able to talk anymore. He couldn't move and he couldn't eat. Like he looked like he was frozen like a statue pretty much. Um, and we checked his blood work again that time and, and nothing was abnormal. So what we think was going on at that point was that we think it was a condition called catatonia, which is actually common in, in, in patients who have schizophrenia or, um, or bipolar. Um, and the common truth for that is that we usually give a medication called um, lorazepam, which is a uh, benzodiazepine. Um, in some people it works really well, but unfortunately in his case, um, it didn't work at all. Like he didn't respond at all to it. And then when we tried to increase the dose, he became way too sedated and sleepy. And that was something we didn't want either. Um, about a week um, to a week and a half went by and he still didn't have any improvement. So we decided to talk to his family about another potential treatment that we could try that is also used in catatonia. And that treatment was called um, electroconvulsive therapy. Um, the family was definitely very hesitant um, to do that, um, given that I don't know if you guys are familiar with some of the portrayals in the media um, and in Hollywood of ECT, but uh, there one example would be, and I think Stranger Things had a, something about it, and then um, the one with, uh, I think is one flew over the birds over the cuckoo's nest or something I, uh, with, uh, I think it was Nicolas Cage. But yeah, so those are two examples of um, where they showed really gruesomely what ECT they thought would look like, um, where the patient's kind of hooked up to like uh, electrodes and they're like shaking and convulsing, which it's not like that at all. So we um, discussed with them kind of what it's like more so, and um, they were agreeable to, um, to proceeding with it because at that point we didn't really have anything else to do. And surprisingly, after two treatments, he started getting better. Um, like he started talking a little bit more um, and like was able, he was more aware of his surroundings at that point. And then after six treatments, he was actually no longer catatonic at all. So he was pretty much back to his baseline, um, which the family was very happy about. So what exactly is ECT? So contrary to what um, Hollywood would like you to believe, um, ECT is a medical procedure and it's done in the hospital um, with an anesthesiologist on hand. Um, and basically what happens is that you have two electrodes um, hooked up to your head and it actually depends on which model or procedure, a technique that they use because some of them it's um, one sided only and they use like um, the guy is holding like a little like um, uh, like electrode thing here. And then he's doing one on the top of the head. So that one is a unilateral one, but sometimes they'll do one on this side and one on the other side. So it just depends on a case by case, like the severity and what um, the patient has uh, responded to in the past. Um, and then you're hooked up to a bunch of monitors to me measure your heart rate and all that stuff. And um, the electrodes here are to measure your brainwave activity. Um, and what happens is the patient will receive medication 
in through their IV from the anesthesiologist, and that's to help put them to sleep so that they're not aware of anything that's going on. So this is never done with you like awake and, and conscious or anything. And they also give you medication to relax your muscles so that when they do induce the seizure, it's, um, it's not going to cause any convulsions or anything. The most I've seen is sometimes um, like the patient will have their toes wiggle or they'll like clench their hands for a bit, but it's not like where they're thrashing or anything like that. That. Um, so it's a very controlled medical procedure and it's actually very effective. Um, I've seen it work wonders on patients with schizophrenia. Um, I've seen it work really well on people with really, really severe depression and uh, persistent suicidal thoughts. Um, and they tend to get better with it as well. And um, I've also seen it work really well for patients with catatonia like my patient um, in this case. Um, and some patients after they have like a course of, typically they do about six to 12 treatments um, and it's usually uh, every other day. Um, sometimes once they're better and they leave the hospital, they, some patients prefer to come back and do like maintenance treatment and they'll do it like sometimes like once a month or something like that too. Um, so these are some of the other treatments that psychiatrists also use. Um, so the common ones that are like right now, like FDA approved and everything include medication, um, therapy, and um, neuromodulation. So that includes like the ECT and the TMS, which is the transcranial magnetic stimulation. And that one is done often in just the outpatient, like in a doctor's office. Um, and that one, you don't need to be uh, sedated or anything like that. It's a very common like outpatient procedure. You would just come in, you get it done, and then you just go home. The other thing is like light therapy for like a seasonal affective disorder. Um, sometimes you can get like a light box and that can help with your mood as well and help with like the depression that's associated. It's not exactly depression. It's more just like you kind of have like low mood sometimes in the winter months because of the lack of sunlight and you're indoors more. Um, so light therapy has been proven to help with that as well. Um, and the cool thing is that there's a lot of new emerging treatments or things that are being researched right now. So um, one thing that's pretty cool right now is the psilocybin research that's coming out and it looks like it's pretty promising for treatment of depression and they're looking at using it for other things, um, for other um, psychiatric conditions as well. Um, ketamine is a big thing right now for depression as well. Um, that's usually done in a hospital setting. Um, and then the other thing is uh, personalized medicine, meaning that there have been tests that have come out over the years um, to look at your like DNA and stuff like that and see how you might respond to different medications based on, um, you know, your genetic makeup and uh, like what your um, metabolism might be like based on your genetic makeup. That still has a lot of research to be done. Um, and that right now it's not really like typically used by psychiatrists because it's not um, that well supported um, like research wise yet. But I'm hoping in the future, um, once they have a better understanding of things that might be something that be more useful to help with catering uh, to treatment and stuff like that. So this is um, just something to go over some of the things that, or where, where some uh, psychiatrists work. And this is just to show you how diverse um, the field of psychiatry is. And you can really cater it to exactly what your preferences are and what you like. Um, so some psychiatrists like to work in private practice and have their own clinics, or some will join like a whole group with a bunch of other psychiatrists. Um, some work in the hospital, either like in the inpatient unit or in the emergency room, um, where you're seeing like acutely suicidal patients or patients who are too dangerous to be um, like out on the streets or at home. So family or sometimes police will bring patients in and you do evaluations for safety in the emergency room setting. And you kind of are deciding whether or not they're safe to be discharged home or if you think they need to stay in the hospital longer. Um, you can also work at like different university academic medical centers. And that would be nice if you're the type of person that really likes to teach and likes to work with other students and residents. Um, there's also all like community mental health centers, um, sometimes like the 
um, government like health clinics and stuff like that are places that definitely have a lot of need for psychiatrists. You can also work as a consultant for um, pharmaceutical companies and kind of give your expertise and your knowledge um, in regards to like drug treatment and develop or drug development. Um, psychiatrists are actually also very much involved in prisons and, and the court system as well, like testifying and determining whether or not um, a patient is competent to stand trial or if you think like the patient might be not guilty because of their mental illness that caused them to not appreciate um, their conduct at the time of a crime that they committed. Um, the VA is another um, place where psychiatrists can work as well as different military settings like uh, military bases and stuff. Um, psychiatrists are also very much needed in nursing homes um, with a lot of the patients having dementia um, and sometimes that comes with some behavioral issues and difficulties as well. Um, and then psychiatrists also are in hospice as well and, and dealing with end of life care. Um, the other thing that's kind of been emerging more so, um, especially over the past uh, year because of the pandemic is telepsychiatry. So um, for example, with me being a third year um, psychiatry resident, we actually do all outpatient um, this year, but because of the pandemic, we've been working mostly from home and talking to um, patients virtually um, that way. And um, I think telepsychiatry likely will be a big thing in the future um, because it also helps, de it helps to um, increase access to care, especially in like rural communities where they might not have that many psychiatrists. Um, that would be a great thing to kind of help with um, managing that barrier for patients to get care. So these are some of the examples of the different psychiatry fellowships that you can do after you finish your four years of residency. Um, the ones on the left are the ones that are currently like board certified where you would have to like sit and take an exam at the end of your fellowship year. Um, and the ones on the right are some of the other ones that you can do, but they don't require um, board certification at this time. Um, so there's like things like child psychiatry and adolescent psychiatry. Um, that is usually a two year fellowship and um, you can either do your four years of psychiatry residency and then do two years of that. Um, or you, some programs actually let you finish your psychiatry residency three years early and then you fast track into child and adolescent and do that for two years. So then that would save you a year of um, fellowship and residency training total. Um, forensic psychiatry would deal with a lot of things pertaining to the law. Um, so that would be like um, working in the courthouse, working in prisons, but then there's also like the civil side of things where you would be doing like fitness for duty evaluations for people who are maybe trying to join the military or the secret service. Um, you could also do a lot of cases pertaining to um, like child custody, like if you think the parent is, is fit um, to, to be able to have custody of the child. Um, I'm trying to think other civil cases, like there are things like related to like terrorism that you could do, especially in the DC area. Um, there's also like disability and malpractice that you could also uh, provide your insight into. Um, other specialties include um, like addiction psychiatry. So you'd be dealing with a lot of substance use disorders like alcohol, um, opiate use, um, like that sort of thing. And then there's also geriatric psychiatry um, where you're dealing with a lot of like elderly patients. A lot of times it's dementia. Um, there's also sleep medicine, which is um, something that you could also do. And I think that also neurology uh, residents can also do sleep medicine. I think a couple other specialties can actually do that. So then the cool thing is you get to work with a lot of people from different um, specialties when you're in fellowship. Um, there's also psychosomatic or consult liaison psychiatry. So what that means is that you would be um, kind of like the psychiatrist consultant in the hospital. A lot of times um, when patients get admitted to the hospital for like, you know, medical reasons and stuff like that, there might be a psychiatric issue that might come up or sometimes an ethical issue that might come up and they often will consult us for that. Um, lastly, uh, we're also in integrated into pain medicine as well, because as you can imagine, people with chronic pain often uh, also have um, psychiatric, um, like depression, anxiety issues as well. 
Um, some of the other ones that aren't um, currently board certified, but you can also get more training in include like women's mental health, like dealing with um, like uh, postpartum depression or perinatal mental health, that sort of thing. Um, there's also f fellowships for eating disorders as well. Um, and then you could also do a neuroscience like research um, fellowship if you're interested in kind of doing more like research related stuff. There's also even like public policy um, fellowships where you could um, work with lawmakers to create laws that would affect mental health, which is um, something that is very much needed. Um, and then if you're interested in student mental health or dealing with college students, um, they also have fellowships for that too. I think Stanford is one of the ones that has that one. Um, so I also wanted to go over a little bit about just kind of like what psychiatry residency looks like, because I definitely didn't know until probably well into med school when I was actually like starting to apply for residency. Um, but as a resident, the first year you're doing usually a little like for us, we did a month of emergency medicine and then we did three months of internal medicine. Um, as well as two months of neurology. And then the rest of the six months we spent doing um, inpatient psychiatry work. Um, so it's cool to be able to kind of get exposure to all the different specialties in residency and kind of be in that more like a uh, doctor role in managing patients and stuff like that. Um, and the stuff that you learn from the different, oops, sorry. The stuff you learn from the different specialties definitely helps you with, um, you know, being a better psychiatrist as well. Uh, and when I talk about the call schedule, it's different for every hospital, but this is just an example of what mine was like. So I didn't ever have any overnight call um, and I only had call from like 8 a.m. to like 12 a.m. Um, sometimes. And so that wasn't very often. It was maybe like it averaged out to three to four times a month when I had to do that. Um, and during call, what you're doing is you're admitting patients, like new patients that get admitted to the hospital, you go see them, you interview them and you write the note and then you put in the like orders for their medications and all that stuff. Um, as a second year, we did all inpatient psychiatry, and then we had uh, three months of uh, consult liaison psychiatry where we practiced those skills of being kind of in the consultant role. And at that point, um, we had 24 hour calls. So that means you would come in at 8 a.m. and then you would leave at 8 a.m. the next day. Um, and that would happen every like once to one or two weeks. Um, and as a third year, it's, things get a lot better. Um, so it's all outpatient. And then we do a lot of intensive like psychotherapy uh, training during our third year. Um, and then our call schedule gets a lot lighter then. Um, and we do 24 hour senior call every two to four weeks. And that means that you're kind of in a more supervisory role. Um, so you're helping out the residents who are first or second years um, with their call. Like if they have questions with admissions or something that comes up, um, you kind of help out with that. And that's only like every, once every two to four weeks. So it's not even that bad. Um, fourth year is a lot of outpatient and um, inpatient psychiatry elective. So we still can, we'll keep a couple patients that we saw during our third year and continue therapy um, during our fourth year as well with the patients. And then we also do some electives and they could be any, it's like every school is different, but um, some schools offer like international electives, um, like in like Spain or like England or, um, or I think there's one, oh, in Vienna as well. Um, and it's to do like research or to do like public health policy, that sort of thing, and kind of understanding their systems over there. Um, and then we also have uh, different electives on like eating disorders, like trauma disorders and that sort of thing. And then our senior calls the same as our third year. And then the typical day of a psychiatry resident is um, usually we wake up like uh, seven to eight in the morning, and then we just kind of get ready. Um, some places um, start at like 8 a.m. for like rounds and stuff to see patients, especially when you're in the hospital. But since I am like outpatient, I start my work day at nine. Um, and I just see patients from nine to 12. And then at 12 o'clock, I usually have like a supervision lunch where I get to meet with um, one of the 
uh, attending doctors and kind of run over my cases and talk over my cases with them and just make sure that I'm like doing the right thing, like starting them on the right medications or like I talk about therapy cases with them and ask them like, you know, this patient came and, and had asked me about, or we talked about this and that, like, how should I say this or what's my, what should be my approach to this situation? Um, then I usually see more patients in the afternoon and then I usually wrap up my notes by like six o'clock. Um, and then usually I'm just done for the day. Um, but sometimes if I'm on senior call, then I will come into the hospital um, and just stay overnight until um, 8 a.m. the next day. Um, but I think that's pretty much all I had for today. Um, if anyone has questions, I am more than happy to answer them. Um, I had a question. Sure. So, um, so what is like, like when you're working with patients specifically, like, how do you like adjust to their certain levels, if that makes sense? Because I know when you're working with patients, you need to have some kind of stamina with patients in a way. What do you mean like by that? Like, how do you adjust to their setting of levels, if that makes sense? Because I know some patients, they kind of like some privacy or they have like different emotions that kind of makes it hard to work with them. I don't know if that makes sense. Sure. Yeah. Um, so everyone's like very different. And um, so you kind of just kind of try to understand where they're coming from usually. And you just kind of are patient with them. Sometimes, especially with patients who have significant childhood trauma and abuse, it's very difficult for them to open up. And so it's like, you just kind of understand where they're coming from and just, if they don't feel like bringing it up that particular day or the first time you're meeting them, then that's okay. You can kind of just like bring it up like in the future when they feel ready. Um, and I think it's just a lot of it's being patient um, with them and, Sometimes um, if they're like very acutely agitated or something like that, or it looks like it's a safety issue, um, then we'll usually have to medicate them just to make sure to help them calm down before um, we proceed with like an interview. So it's definitely a case by case basis. Um, I think there was a question in the chat. Let me see. Um, great question. How is the ADHD tested? Yeah, so um, ADHD is a DSM-5 criteria for it. Um, so it deals with like inattentiveness um, and as well as like, um, like if you're hyperactive, that's another criteria. And there are some more specific like tests that psychologists do. Um, in order to test for ADHD, that's more extensive. Um, I haven't done that type of testing or administered that test, so I don't know how, like, what exactly is on it. But um, yeah, that's something that I've heard is like pretty extensive to test for it. But usually, I just kind of ask them what their symptoms are, like if they have trouble focusing in different settings, like if it's at home and at school, um, that sort of thing. The other question I see here is how often do patients diagnosis not get better? Um, so that is something that is very much, I don't have like a, a clear statistic on that or anything. Um, but I know that especially with more of the severe mental illnesses like um, schizophrenia, um, a lot of times it doesn't get significantly better if they were late to treatment or if sometimes um, they have like exacerbation episodes. So um, you can think of it kind of as like a stepwise thing where after every episode where they have uh, acute decompensation, it's very difficult for them to even with treatment to get back to their baseline. So that's why it's really important with um, patients who have mental illness to um, get treatment early and try to stick on the treatment and, and take the medication consistently. But I've seen patients with schizophrenia who once they were on the right medications, they were able to live a fulfilling life, like have a job, 
um, and, you know, like pay their rent and like do everything a normal person does. So it's just, it varies a lot. And um, sometimes if there's also substance use that's playing into the picture, that makes those cases a little bit more difficult. Um, with things like depression um, or anxiety, I've also seen a lot of times it does get better. Um, and it's just a matter of um, being willing to, to be patient and, um, and you know, work together with the patient to be on the right medication regimen. Um, let's see. The next question I see is how do you keep the doctor-patient relationship strictly professional. Um, like what would happen if the patient tries to hang out with you outside of session? Um, that's actually a great question too. Um, so that is something that's very important to keep uh, the doctor patient relationship very professional. Um, there have been a lot of malpractice cases related to when people tried to blur the lines um, between that. Um, so it's just important to develop those clear boundaries with patients um, and just make sure that they know that it's for their best interest that it stays professional and within the therapy session only. Um, how is a psychologist different from a psychiatrist? Yeah, um, so we, I did talk about that a little bit earlier in the um, session, but the main uh, takeaways from that are that um, a psychologist um, goes through um, undergrad and then they go through, it's usually like a, get a master's and some get a PhD and they're more geared towards like doing therapy. Um, and so they get a lot more training in therapy. Um, whereas a psychiatrist goes through medical school um, before going into residency. And so they're kind of understand the more like medical background to things more, but they can do usually, usually therapy and um, medication management. I will say that with my training as a psychiatrist, I don't get as much like in detail, in depth, like training in all the different modalities of psychotherapy as like maybe a psychologist does. Um, and also psychiatrists usually, um, they can order um, like diagnostic testing and they can also prescribe medications um, and they deal with more of the complex psychiatric conditions whereas a um, psychologist might not um, be able to manage the more complex um, conditions. Um, let's see. Uh, the next question is about developing bonds with many other patients. And yeah, I think that um, a lot of times at the beginning, it's sometimes with some patients, they might have some hesitancies with entering therapy and stuff. So it does take time, but usually after you get to know patients better, um, they see that you're there to help them and you genuinely care about them. And so I would say that I have a really good relationship with um, all of my patients. Um, how is stutter diagnosed? That is actually a good question. And um, that would be kind of, you just kind of get a better understanding of what, um, how the stutter started, um, what the nature of it's like, um, and kind of just getting a better understanding of it and seeing um, if it influence, if it's only happening in certain settings or if it's happening all the time um, in multiple different settings. Um, how long does it typically take to diagnose someone? Uh, usually we can kind of start formulating a diagnosis after the first time we meet someone. Um, and sometimes if I'm not like a hundred percent sure, and I'm not willing to hang my hat on it yet, I'll keep it broad and I'll say like unspecified depressive disorder. Cause I'm not sure if it's like a true major depressive disorder or it's something that might be caused by something else. And then as I get more information and get to know the patient better, you can kind of like make the diagnosis more specific as you go. Um, okay. And then the next one is, what do you feel are ideal characteristics of a psychiatrist and what helped you make your decision um, to, or what, uh, what helped you make your decision to feel like psychiatry would be a good fit for you and you a good fit for psychiatry? Um, Yes, that is a great question too. Um, so I think that uh, a good psychiatrist is someone who is very patient, understanding, has a lot of compassion and empathy. 
um, and is uh, up for the challenge and, and can think critically and, and um, be kind of like a problem solver. Um, what helped me make my decision was kind of just seeing what it was, how mental health was like very heavily stigmatized in um, the Asian community and within my own family and how I saw that that stigma really created a huge barrier for a lot of people in my family who to get the help that they needed. Um, so I kind of fell into psychiatry because I just felt like um, I wanted to be an advocate for mental health and I wanted to make others understand that it's okay to seek help and that it's okay um, to have a mental illness um, and it's not something that you should be ashamed of. Um, I think that when I first realized I wanted to do um, psychiatry was when I was a third year in medical school and I had done my first um, psychiatry rotation. So actually when I entered medical school, I thought I was going to do um, neurology actually, because I was like just really fascinated about the brain and stuff. But I saw that um, with neurology, it was great because like you could really, you could identify exactly what was going on with a patient and be able to identify exactly like, you know, where the lesion is in the brain that's causing the symptoms they're having. But a lot of times, you can't really do much about it. Um, and I just found that was really frustrating that you could know exactly what's going on, but you couldn't really help the patient get better. As much as psychiatry is kind of like the opposite where you might not know exactly what's going on, but a lot of times the patients do get better um, with treatment. And I found that to be super rewarding. Um, and I just really liked being able to form those uh, patient relationships um, during my third year rotation. I really like talking to patients and getting to know them really well. Um, so that's kind of what led me to decide to go into psychiatry. Um, what programs did you take as an undergrad and graduate and how would it be different uh, to be a psychologist? Um, so I was a biology major as an undergrad. Um, my the college I went to was kind of a little bit smaller. So um, they they didn't really have many of the more like atypical, like non-traditional like degrees and stuff. So I just was a plain simple biology major and I took some like marketing classes just for fun. Um, and I guess graduate school you mean would be medical school. Um, and medical school is kind of a set curriculum. So you kind of just do whatever is, handed to you for the most part. And you do have some room to do electives. So for, as my, in my third and fourth year, I did more like psychiatry. Um, and what did I do to get to where I am today? Um, so I would say that um, in high school, you should just be focusing on getting good grades is, is the most important thing. I think that medical school is getting more and more competitive these days. So um, trying to work hard and keep your grades up and, and doing well in college. And I think just like pursuing things that you think you are interested in more so than just doing things just because you think it's good for your resume. So um, a lot of times, like a lot of my um, like med student friends who went into psychiatry, they did like, for example, they were really artsy and they really liked um, like kind of like writing and stuff like that. So they used to like, they had their own blog and they kind of wrote like, you know, little stories and reflections about what it was like um, in med school or like one of them like wrote a play that was like psychiatry related. Um, if you like research, um, that's something that you can do. Um, and I guess just doing volunteer work and, um, you know, if you're interested in, you know, working with a particular patient population or a particular general population. So for me, when I was in high school, um, I did a, I'm trying to remember what I did back then because it's been so long. Um, I did some volunteer work at the hospital at that time in the emergency department um, with, as well as the adult uh, emergency department and the pediatric emergency department. Um, and then from there, I kind of moved into, cause I like liked kid, working with kids. So then I worked on the neonatal unit and I just helped like rock babies to sleep and stuff like that. 
Um, I also worked at a nursing home as well. Um, just kind of like would go there on weekends to like hang out with the senior citizens there and like play bingo with them, um, stuff like that. I didn't really do any research until I got to college and I was interested in the brain at that time. So I did some brain research then. Um, but yeah, I'd say just like, if you're able to identify what your passions are and, and kind of go work and do put in the effort and work for that that's kind of what will make you unique and stand out and that would help for your application um is it hard to diagnose narcissists sociopaths psychopaths how are they diagnosed um so yeah so those are um more like um personality disorders so Typically, we don't diagnose them on the first encounter because you have to have a better like understanding of their longitudinal history, um, because that usually is it's a persistent trait and personality that they carry throughout their life. So um, with that, you would um, kind of have to get a lot of collateral information. So like if you happen to have arrest records um, or like their legal history, talking to their family, what were they like as a child? Like were they the type of child that used to set fires a lot or like um, used to get in trouble for getting in fights with um, other students at school or if they have a history of hurting animals, that sort of thing. So you wanna get a really longitudinal history um, to be able to really accurately diagnose something like that. Um, okay. And then the last question here I see is that, um, thank you for talking about how, okay. And then, oh, okay. Thanks for the comment. I appreciate that. Um, anything else guys? These are all great questions, by the way. How do you deal with the stress or emotional baggage that um, some patients may offload onto you? That is an excellent question as well. Um, so as you can imagine, the patients are coming to you because they are in distress and they, they need someone to talk to. And a lot of times it's, you're listening to a lot of very difficult things, sometimes very um, horrible things have happened to them and has really crippled their, who they are and how they function to this day. And so um, the thing that I find that really helps me is just being able to um, compartmentalize that. And usually when work's over, I, you know, try not to think about it. Um, I do things that I enjoy that I find fulfilling. So um, I do a lot of hiking. Um, I do a lot of like Netflix um, as well, as I imagine a lot of us are doing these days. Um, and then I'm really into like baking and cooking. So those are ways that um, I find as an outlet to help me um, kind of offload some of the um, difficult things that I have to listen to on a daily uh, basis. Uh, next question was, what was your most rewarding and most challenging patient experience so far? Um, that's a great question. I think that for me, a lot of them are rewarding and uh, sometimes the most challenging ones that in the moment you're just like super frustrated because you're like, I don't know if I can see the light at the end of the tunnel. And then like, you know, the, a year later you see them and they're like a lot better. That's like uh, really rewarding. But I actually would say that for me, it was, I had a patient um, once that she had come in and initially we, the initial like diagnosis was that she had um, like some sort of cognitive disorder, um, like neurocognitive issue, like maybe we were thinking maybe dementia or Alzheimer's or something like that. But she didn't really quite fit into that. Like her memory wasn't very good and she was out of it. Um, and um, she just seemed very confused when she first came in. But then we realized that it was likely because she had um, delirium from uh, like a urinary tract infection um, that was making her very confused. And when we cleared that up, we still noticed that there were some residual psychiatric um, symptoms. Um, at that point, we called the, um, the daughter who was kind of estranged to her, but the daughter actually shared that she had a history of schizophrenia 
Um, and so when she was with us, um, she was like very paranoid and like she um, like just was super disorganized in her thinking. And when she talked, she didn't make sense. And she was just accusing everyone of these like, you know, various things. And then she wasn't eating because she was very suspicious of the food being poisoned and stuff like that. Um, we actually ended up uh, trying to do medications for her and giving her antipsychotic medications. But after two weeks, it's two to three weeks, it still didn't work. We decided to give her um, electroconvulsive therapy and she, it was a night and day difference. Like after that, she was like functioning normally again, like she was eating, she wasn't paranoid and so preoccupied on it anymore. Um, she was more cheerful, interactive, and we were actually able to get her discharged um, home. And um, we had her go to like a day hospital program. So it's like someone comes and picks her up every day and takes her to the hospital just to do like therapy and groups every day um, for like two weeks. And she looked really good at that point. So that was a really rewarding one for me. Um, the next question is, uh, do you have any tips for getting into a BSMD program? Any tips on the interview uh, to get in? Yeah. Um, so, cause I uh, got in like so long ago, um, I don't know how much the landscape has changed now compared to um, how things are now. Um, but back then I remember that um, we had to submit a personal statement, like why you wanna go into medicine. Um, and then I remember at that point, I didn't do as much extracurriculars as I, I imagine a lot of you guys are probably doing nowadays. But at that time, I was only doing pretty much like a little bit of volunteer work. Um, and I didn't even do any research at that time. I did do like a internship, but it was like an engineering related internship. Um, just because at that point, I wasn't 100% sure if I wanted to do engineering or medicine. And then I learned from that internship, I definitely didn't want to do that. But um, I think just trying to have a good grades, like um, I studied hard in school. Um, I took a lot of AP classes. So having good grades, I think is really important to at least get you noticed. Doing well on your SAT also matters because unfortunately that's usually some of the first metrics they use to weed out applicants. Um, and then just trying to do extracurriculars that make you unique and, uh, and make you stand out from everyone else. Um, and I think having a good personal statement um, is important too. Um, so those are kind of the things I would suggest. And then with the interview, they ask very common questions like why medicine? Um, if you weren't doing medicine, what else would you be doing? What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? So just kind of like being prepared for those questions is important. Um, so the next question is, what are non-psychiatry ways to destigmatize mental health in the Asian community? Um, what can the everyday person do? That is an excellent question. Um, so I think that it starts with just being able to um, talk openly with your parents and with other family members and friends about mental health. Like if you're not feeling like if you're having a bad day, don't be afraid to just share it and just get it out there and talk about it. Um, and I think that educating your parents and educating kind of the older generation about the importance of mental health is very um, helpful as well. I think that when I first went into psychiatry, a lot of my family members were kind of like, why are you doing that kind of a thing? And um, I think that as now that I'm kind of like three years into it um, and every time that comes up, I've been able to kind of, you know, tell them that I think it's really important and all that stuff. Um, and I think that it's something that's just not talked about enough. It's actually become a, to a point where now a lot of um, my own like family members or friends of family are coming to me with their problems and asking for help. So I think that just being a kind of designated point person to kind of talk about these things and be not afraid to share about these experiences and stuff um, is really important. Um, the next question I see is, uh, I heard there are some controversies behind um, ECT. What are your opinions about using this in general? And then are there any serious risks that come with it? 
Um, so that's an excellent question. Um, there definitely is a lot of controversies um, just because I think a lot of it comes from um, general public misunderstanding because no one ever sees what ECT looks like. I didn't know what it looked like until I actually was able to sit in in a session and start performing it myself. Um, but I mean, the media in Hollywood always portrays it as this like gruesome form of punishment. And that might have been the case, like, you know, way back in the day. But nowadays, with the medical advancements and anesthesia and everything, it is um, very effective. And how it works is that what you're doing is you're inserting your, you're not inserting, but you're using electrostimulation to, um, to cause a seizure in the brain. And the belief is that when there is a seizure in the brain, your brain releases a whole bunch of neurochemicals and um, neurotransmitters that helps to flood the brain with all of those um, electrical and neurochemical stimulation to help um, improve um, like depression and schizophrenia and like bipolar. So it kind of helps to remodulate the um, the neurocircuitry in the brain. And there's been a lot of research that's been done in it. And it is a very safe procedure. Um, the risk that comes with it is just the general risk that comes with the anesthesia more so than anything else. Um, and so it would be the same as if you were the anesthesia risk that you would have if you're undergoing anesthesia for a procedure or something like that. Um, the main side effect to ECT is that it causes sometimes some memory issues. Um, so sometimes people might have a little bit of um, trouble remembering the time period right around when they had the procedure, but the memory issue is not an issue with everyone. And a lot of times it gets better. And we often tell patients that sometimes if you feel like you're a little bit more forgetful, just kind of writing things down definitely helps. Um, like just like making lists and stuff like that. Any other questions today, guys? Why do sodium levels affect mental health? Yeah, so um, as you can imagine, the mind and the body are very much interconnected. So when you have like electrolyte abnormalities, um, it definitely affects how the brain functions. So for example, if your blood sugar is too low, you're gonna be confused. If your electrolyte levels are too low, it's gonna affect your brain because your brain needs the like glucose, it needs um, like sodium, potassium, it needs all of those things to be able to function. Um, you'll learn later in like biology or like anatomy class that the way neurons like signal with each other is based on like the sodium channels and stuff like that. And the, um, the electro um, stimulate or so like, I'm a little bit like far removed from biology, but basically what happens is that when your sodium levels are not accurate, it affects the way the neurons are able to communicate with each other because the electrical stimulation is produced by the um, like ions moving between channels in the neurons. Um, are there Asian specific mental health resources you recommend? That is an excellent question. Um, there are a lot of um, like groups on like Facebook and like on um, Instagram and like social media platforms um, have a lot of um, Asian mental health resources. The one that I really like is um, the one from uh, Harvard um, Mass. Uh, it's like Mass Gen Hospital. They have, uh, if you look up the Harvard, like Mass General Hospital and like Asian mental health, they, it will come up. I don't remember what the name of the place is called specifically um, or the name of the organization, but they have excellent like,